Chapter 2.1, Set Concepts. So to begin this section of our class, we're going to be talking about what is a set. Now a lot of times with mathematical terms, the words can seem a little bit out there, right? They don't necessarily correlate with what you would expect. But when we talk about sets, a lot of the terminology is going to be exactly what you would expect in an English, like in English, right? So what is a set? A set is simply a collection of objects. Same way you have a set of cards, a set of colored pencils, a set of silverware, right? That's a collection of objects. So those objects are going to be referred to as the elements or members of the set. Um, there are three main ways to indicate a set. So the first way is via description, such as the set of colors in the rainbow. Right? I've just described what is in the set, and then if you know the seven colors in the rainbow, you know what is in that set. Next is roster form. So in this form, we list each element, element separated by commas with curly braces on either end. So here, the colors in the rainbow are in fact curly bracket, red, comma, orange, comma, yellow, comma, green, comma, blue, comma, indigo, comma, violet, curly bracket, right? We have to use these curly brackets to indicate that we are forming a set. That's sort of read in mathematical terms as the set containing these things. So if you don't put the curly brackets and you just list the things, I will mark it wrong. It is not in set notation, it is not in roster form. Now the third notation is a little bit trickier notation we're not going to see as often here, but we will explore it a little bit in this chapter. So set builder notation. This is the sort of fancier notation that can be used especially with mathematical terms. So the set um, where we still use our curly brackets, but we essentially define the elements either verbally or using some sort of equation. So in this case, I have curly bracket x, this uh, vertical line, x equals color in the rainbow. So essentially what this is read as is x are the elements. And then we define what properties do, uh, does x have. x has the property of being a color in the rainbow. So it's x, this vertical line, conditions to define x, or the elements in the set. We'll see some examples of this later. But for right now, a set is well-defined if its contents can be clearly determined. So for example, the set of all states in the US is well-defined since we all agree on the list of the current states. We know the 50 states, even if you can't list all 50 of them. If I name a state, if I say Ohio, you can tell me yes or no. Is Ohio a state? Yes, it is. If I say, uh, if I say Mexico, can you tell me if that's a state? Say yes or no. We all agree on this so it is well-defined. However, the set of all sandwiches is not well-defined because we can't clearly say whether or not, for example, a hot dog is a sandwich. Some people are going to say yes, some people are going to say no. There isn't a good definition to say one way or the other. You might have an opinion on this, but the point is that not everybody agrees, and so it's not well-defined. So let's look at, that, at our set notation a little bit further. So sets are generally named with capital letters, but some specific sets use special characters. We use this uh, symbol called the element symbol, which looks kind of like a rounded capital E to mean is in or is an element of. So two with the rounded capital E, curly bracket one, two, three, curly bracket, means two is in the set containing one, two, and three, which it is, it's right here. But two is not in, so we'd use the same symbol with a line through it to mean two is not in one, three, five, because, well, it's not there. So for example, we might say A, capital A, is the set of odd numbers between zero and 10, which we could then list in roster form as A equals curly bracket, one, three, five, seven, nine, curly bracket. We could then say one, is an element of A, 
But 0 is not an element of a, because 1 is an odd number between 0 and 10, but 0 is not an odd number between 0 and 10. So our first special character, the one we're going to see the most in this class, is the natural numbers. So the natural numbers, which remember are 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, have a special symbol which is essentially like an n with a second um, line in the middle. Um, if you write just a normal capital N for simplicity, I'll understand that's what you're going for. But generally, like, this is what you're going to want to write. Sometimes I'll just write it as a double line um, right next uh, on the left side. The point is, is to kind of make it look a little bit fancy. That's not the best drawing of it like that. That's often how I will write it because I cannot write in a font. <laughs> um, but somehow a double line, whether you write it like this or like that, or you just write the capital N, I'll understand what you're going for. But we call the natural, letter, uh, natural numbers N always. So now our set A can be written in that set builder notation that I defined earlier as the following. So we have the set name A equals, which we could read as is, the set of is what those curly brackets mean. If we were reading them, we read this symbol verbally, we get the set of, then this first part just says all elements x. That vertical line is read as such that, so all elements x such that, now the conditions on x are x is in the natural numbers, and x is less than 10, and x is odd. So all three of these are conditions on x, and so we are all possible x values that fall under those conditions. And that is the set builder notation. So what if I wanted to write the set b of natural numbers less than 21 um, in roster and set builder notation? So in order to do this, we want to think about um, first, we've got natural numbers here, right? So that's going to be our n. So we're talking about elements in n, okay? Less than 21. And we're starting with roster notation. That just means we need to list it out, right? So natural numbers start at the number 1, and we're less than not, or equal to just straight up less than. So this is, and there's no other conditions, not odd or even or anything like that. So to list them out in roster notation, it just becomes 1, 2, 3 through 20. Now notice we use the dot, dot, dot here in the middle, our ellipses, to indicate that this pattern continues. 1, 2, 3 pattern continues up to 20. Now to do this in set builder notation, we're going to start in the same way, right? The set builder notation starts with the same three symbols here, B equals curly bracket. But then we always start with x, and then the such that vertical line, and then the conditions on x. So the conditions are, once again, x is a natural number, and x is less than 21. So x is a natural number, and x is less than 21. All right, so is 25 in b, and is 5 in b? So even though I didn't list either of those numbers here, that doesn't mean they're not in B because of that dot, 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 right? So in other words, is 25 a natural number less than 21? No, of course it's not, right? Because 25 is greater than 21. And tw five, on the other hand, that one is between one and 21 and is a natural number. So five is in B. So we write that like this, right? Remembering that 25, we can write not in with just the is in symbol, the line through it. Okay, now write in words how you would read the set builder notation of B. So once again, set builder notation has a very explicit verbal way of reading it. We start with the name, so B is the, is the set of all x such that x is in n, or x is an element of the natural numbers, and x is less than 21, period. All right.
So now we've explored our basic notations. Let's go and see if we can go in the opposite direction of converting from a notation, in, uh, from the set builder notation into roster form. Let's see if we can understand the set builder notation. So here we have a equals the set of all x such that x is an element of the natural numbers and x is between 2 and 8, including 2, but not including 8. So x is greater than or equal to 2, x is less than 8, like so. So if I wanted to list out all the elements that, are, that fall into these conditions, we would start from 2 and go up to 8, but we would not include 8. And there's no other conditions here. I just know that I'm only counting counting numbers because we're talking about the natural numbers. The natural numbers also known as the counting numbers, the ones we can count on our fingers. We're not talking about fractions and decimals and all of that. So 2 up to 7. Notice that I stop there. We do not include 8 because x has to be less than 8. But x can be equal to 2. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and we're done. So we have a few classifications of sets we're going to look at. First is finite sets. So if we can count the specific number of elements in a set, then it is called a finite set. A finite set can have no elements or any natural number of elements. So essentially what I mean by count the specific number is we have to be able to stop at some point. So 100 elements, 1,000 elements, a million elements, at some point I'm going to stop. But the other type of uh, classification would be thus an infinite set. So this is a set that does not stop. So if it's not finite, it's said to be infinite. We can still count as we go, but the point is, is we would never stop. So the natural numbers, for example, is an infinite set because there's no greatest natural number. We just keep going, right? A million, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion, etc., etc., etc. for forever, right? There's no point in which we stop counting. So it is infinite. Now looking at these different roster notations here, which of these would be infinite and which would be finite? So the first one has the elements 40, 50, 60. I can count the number of elements. Number of elements are 1, 2, 3. So that's finite. Here, even though it has this dot 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 in the middle, it still has an end point. Right? So I wouldn't say there's three elements in here. I would say there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten total elements because I'd have to count the ones that I'm not writing out, but there's still ten. This ellipsis, on the other hand, is does the opposite thing. It says continue on this pattern, but there's no stopping point. And if it never stops, that means it must go on infinitely. That's the only other option. So in this case, this one ends up being infinite. Because even though I can count 1, 2, 3, 4, I technically have to keep counting 5, 6, 7, 8 to count my elements, and I'd go on forever. Now this one is a special um, set. It is called the empty set. So the empty set is the set containing no elements. So it's like if we have a deck of cards in a box and I take all the cards out. The box is now empty. It is an empty set of cards, right? It still exists but it's empty, okay? So in this case, it's finite because I can count the number of elements. The number of elements is, in fact, zero, which we're going to explore a little bit more in a moment because cardinal numbers or cardinality symbolized by n parenthesis a parenthesis refer to the number of elements in a set. So we take those sets we had before the finite ones at least, and look at what uh, what is their cardinality. I've already essentially said what the cardinality of the first one is, right? Because there's one, two, three. Cardinality of the second one, I have to count out everything that's in it. Not just the three that are seen, but what is not seen. So this becomes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten elements total. This one, the empty set, as I said, it's a set containing nothing. What is nothing? That means it has zero elements in it. There are zero cards in this deck. So, 
zero. Now, here I have in uh, D another situation where we're going off to infinity on one side and infinity to, the, infinity to the other. So in fact, this one's cardinality is infinite. Um, if I describe a set verbally once again, we can still say the number of elements, right? The states in the US, we know how many there are. There are 50 of them, so this cardinality is 50. And finally, this last um, set builder notation form, we have the set of all x such that x is a natural number and x is less than or equal to 5. Well, it might help to write it out, natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, or equal to, so we include 5 right there. So that's five elements. So in fact, we get each of these answers, remembering how the notation works, that n parenthesis a parenthesis means the number of elements in that set. So here we have set d, it'd be n d. Here n b, and so on. Here n states, because I didn't give that set a nice name. So a set is equal to another set, symbolized using the equal sign we know, if and only if set A and set B contain exactly the same elements. Order does not matter when we talk about sets. So the set 1, 2, 3 and the set 3, 2, 1 are the same. Again, think about a deck of cards. If I shuffle it, it's still the same deck of cards, right? It still has all the same elements in it. We wouldn't say that it's a new deck of cards just because I've shuffled the order. But a set A is equivalent to a set B if and only if their cardinalities are the same. But we have, dif we have maybe different elements. So, for example, if we have a set ABC and a set apple orange pear, both of them have three elements, one, two, three, one, two, three, so their cardinalities are both three, which means they are equivalent, but they are not equal because a set of letters and a set of fruit are obviously not the same thing. So any set that is equal must also be equivalent, but not in the other direction as seen above. So these, of course, have the same number of elements n of both of those sets is uh, n of both of those sets is 3 the cardinality is 3 and they happen to be equal cuz the three elements in the set are the same so the order you write a set in will never matter we just there's some convention to we like writing sets in numerical order or something like that but if you don't it doesn't make it wrong now we also have this sort of fancier term called a one-to-one -one correspondence. So set A and set B can be placed in one-to-one -one correspondence if every element of set A can be matched with exactly one element of set B and vice versa. So this happens when your sets are equivalent. Anytime your sets are equivalent, this is possible. So if we wanted to create a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set S and the set C, here we have S is four states and C is four capitals of states. I could then connect them, right? The cap, uh, I could say uh, North Carolina connects to Columbia, Georgia connects to Raleigh, South Carolina to Tallahassee, and Florida to Atlanta. Obviously, this would not be the correct matching of capitals, right? But if you were given a sort of fill in the blank test and you were supposed to fill in which capital goes with which state, this would be a possible answer you could provide it'd be a one-to-one -one correspondence. But if you wanted the actually correct answer, we'd have to reorder this a bit. There's in fact many different options. Here's another one that would once again be incorrect because Florida should match with Tallahassee and well, Georgia and Atlanta, that one's correct, but there's plenty of stuff going on here that is not correct, right? But we have many different options of how you could fill out this fill in the blank test. All of them are just examples of different one-to-one -one correspondences. Now, if I gave you that fill-in-the-blank test and I gave you some fifth state capital, but only four states, I'm making it more difficult on you because you have to, you can't just necessarily guess the right four capitals, right? That wouldn't be 
a one-to-one -one correspondence because you're going to be left over with one of the capitals, right? Something's not going to match. Now our last fancy uh, type of set we're going to look at is the null or empty set and then its opposite which is the universal set. We'll see that on the next slide. So the set that contains no elements, as I said before, we often just denote as two curly brackets with nothing inside. There's also a sort of fancier symbol we can use, which is this. It's like an, a zero with a line through it. That is the empty set symbol. Now, a big note here is that if you write the uh, curly braces with the empty set symbol inside, that is absolutely incorrect because that set would be read as, because we read, remember we can read a curly brace as the set containing. So this would be the set containing the empty set. So it's a set containing a set. It's like if I had um, a box full of empty boxes, right? So this container that contains the empty box of cards, that contain the, the big container with the empty box of cards in it, that big container is not empty, right? It has the empty box. But the box of cards where I've taken all the cards out, that box we would say is empty. But the bigger container con that has the empty box in it is not empty. It is, in fact, has cardinality of one. It has one empty box in it. Similarly, if we write the set containing zero, that's also not a way to write the empty set. It is a set that contains the element zero and has also a cardinality of one. It has the number zero in it. That is one element, cardinality of one. It's not empty. So when I say you can use either of these sim symbols to represent the empty set, I mean either of them, not together. Do not combine them. Do not combine them with something else. It's one or the other, not both, okay? And that is the empty set. So that's the box where we've taken all the cards out of it. The reverse to that is the universal set. So the universal set, symbolized often by just a capital U, is the set that contains all of the elements for any specific discussion. So when the universal set is given, only the elements in the universal set may be considered when working with the problem. So for example, say our universal set is animals. Then if I ask which elements of that set can fly, you wouldn't tell me airplanes because that's not part of the discussion we're having. That's what a universal set does for us. It kind of narrows down our discussion to one particular universe of discourse is what it's called, but one particular area we're talking about. We're talking about animals. We're not going to talk about airplanes when we're talking about animals, right? Even though it would answer the generic question, what flies, it wouldn't answer my question, which is what flies when we're talking about animals. All right, so that is it for our introduction to sets. Next, we're going to get into what are subsets, and then we'll start sort of working with these sets and see what we can do with all of our set definitions.